Welcome to the podcast. My name is Chris Hall, your host. This is Peak Dawn, where we help people choose powerfully every to the, every day. Today, I've got the honor of having an Olympian athlete on, Kaylee Gilchrist. Now, Kaylee is a multi multi sports athlete who won um, in water polo in Rio in 2016, and is also a professional surfer. So, Kaylee, I'm just going to get straight into it. Welcome onto the show today, and it's an absolute pleasure to have you on. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, absolutely. Now, tell me, whereabouts are you dialing in from the world today? I, I believe you're based in California. Is that right? Yeah, Newport Beach, California. We're kind of born and raised, been here, um, yeah, 28 years now. Nice, nice, fantastic. Um, my my wife uh, lived in California for many years and, um, you know, then I stole her away down under, down in Australia. But I understand that you've actually surfed at the beach that I live at. Yeah, I have. I surfed at Avoca Beach, which is such a small world, but I've been to Australia a bunch for both water polo and surfing and have made it made it to your area. I love that. I love that. It really is a small world that gives me goosebumps. Um, so Kaylee, look, I'm, I'm fascinated to have you on the show today to really talk about um, what it means to perform at the level of um, a professional athlete and also an Olympian. Um, I just kind of, I always like to go into backstories a little bit. Um, it's my understanding that your father, Sandy um, Gilchrist, he was actually an Olympian athlete that won um, two gold medals in 1964 and 68 as a swimmer. Is that correct? But for the Canadian team, well, I, he wished he won two gold medals, um, but he did He did compete for the Canadian swim team, 64 and 68. His best finish was a fourth, which is a heartbreaker, probably the worst place you could get in the Olympics because <laughs> you just miss away from the bronze. But um, yeah, he swam and he also swam at USC, the University of Southern California, where I followed in his footsteps. And then that's where I played water polo and then uh, ended up making it to Olympic Games and hopefully two Olympic Games just like him and um, – 1964 was held in Tokyo, like you said. So it'll be really special if I make this team and get to compete in Tokyo in 2021. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, so so again, kind of like going back to the backstory. So you got your dad that's um, you know competing in the Olympics, and um, you're growing up, and imagine you're falling in love with water from a young age. And um, what was it like to have um, a father um, as a mentor? You know, to kind of what was the influence of your father when you were growing up? If you think back being to, you know, back being to a, a little girl and, you know, whether it be participating in sports or watching sports, you know, what was, what was the influence of your father on you from a young age? Yeah, I think uh, our relationship is really unique in the sense that I think when I was younger, he didn't really push me, you know, he didn't make me swim. It was just something that, you know, at my sister and I learned how to swim, did like a very mellow swim team. And I just started to, uh, relate with sports, any sport. And I was a little tomboy growing up. We had such a solid little crew that um, our elementary school friends that I'm still friends with these days. And I just played every sport uh, because that's what my crew did. And I just competed with them because I wanted to be better than them. And um, my dad just let me do whatever. Um, yeah. Slowly but surely, it kind of led to basketball, surfing, and water polo. Yeah. And he would say little things here and there just because he obviously had a lot of the similarities growing up in sports and understands sports and has made it to the top level too. Um, when I was, you know, around 12, the last thing you want to do is take advice from your parents. So <laughs> I, I, I wish I probably li I listened to him a little bit more. Um, but then, you know, coming around full circle, I, I just listen to any advice he gives me now and mm -hmm. understand and that his journey was similar to mine. And, um, you know, he's, he's plenty of words of wisdom. And now it's more of a really cool, like, you know, we're pals rather than like father daughter. And we just get mm -hmm. to share going to USC football games together, get to share stories about the Olympic games. So it was really unique. And I think I've been very lucky that it was never forced or pushed. Mm. Uh, there's buttons. He obviously knows he can push. That'll just upset me and frustrate me, but he probably does it on purpose to push me a little bit more. I remember yeah. receiving a text before the Rio games, basically, you know, he's, he's a man of few words. And he basically says, you know, this is the last hurrah. What you're going to go into is going to be some of the greatest memories of your life. Like make sure you look around and enjoy it all. Nice. Wow. Yeah. Wow. 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 Okay. Now I find it really interesting from a parenting point of view as well. I and mean, if you, if you put, you know, yourself in, in your shoes of your father, I think when we think about raising children and all that kind of stuff, we can almost see the cliche thing of parents, you know, putting pressure on our, on our kids to, um, to perform or take them to every single practice or whether they want to be a, you know, a child model or a ballet or whatever, it doesn't matter what it is. And they name the, you know, name the pursuit. Um, it, it can come across as a cliche, but I think some people assume that you have to put lots of pressure on a child to perform like that. So that's really cool um, to hear that that was just more of a free reign. And I suppose that must have clearly come from a place of deep, deep passion for the sports yourself. Um, did you, you know, 
did you have a reverence for your father growing up in terms of you know like looking up to him and you know being free to play these things but you kind of knew like yeah my dad my dad did this you know so that's kind of cool like what, what was your attitude towards like looking up to him having an you know literally an olympian um for a father? yeah i think well i think um what you said beforehand just that there was no pressure as a parenting standpoint i have an older sister that's about 20 months older than me uh -huh. and she is exact opposite so i think my dad just figured if he got another girl it was going to be like my sister who's very unathletic very much so into fashion and uh so he's just like i guess this is what i get so maybe mm. maybe my sister prepped him to not force the or pressure me into sports so i'll thank her for that one mm. um but i think when i was younger i didn't really understand or have you know could wrap around my mind the, the magnitude of my dad being an olympian you know i just right, thought okay. it was like bragging rights at school Mm -hmm. you know, like from eight to 10 to 12 is like, yeah, well, my dad was an Olympian. I don't really know what that means, but it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Like what's your dad. And then and it wasn't until I started dreaming of the Olympics and, and made it a goal myself, or at least to become an elite athlete mm -hmm. that I was like, oh, this is really cool. Like, yeah, I do look up to him. Like, yeah, I want him to tell me more stories of his sporting career and of the Olympic games and asking him to see his photos that he's had from the 64 and 68 games and mm -hmm. um, start connecting him more on a deeper level when I realized that it was a dream of mine as well. So it wasn't until like, I think when I was 12 years old, I had a dream of going to the Olympics. And then it kind of my path to get there was very unique in the sense that I surfed and I thought water polo was over. And then come full circle after college, I realized water polo is what I wanted to pursue. And it's like my 12 year old self even knew before, you know, my 24 year old self did. It's fascinating that I understand there's a cool story about one of your report cards, is it in terms of what you wrote down as a goal? Was it when you were 12 or something? Yeah, it was, um, it was a school project. It was a cookbook for foreign languages. So we had to get a bunch of different recipes and stuff. And you had to write about the author. And, you know, I said, Kaylee, 12 years old from Newport beach, blah, 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 blah. And in the future, I would love to be on Newport Harbor High School's varsity water polo team, attend University of Southern California on athletic scholarship and compete in two Olympic games. And yes. I think I found that like that was hidden for 10 years. And I think I found it when I was training for Rio back in 2015, and pulled mm. it out. And I was like, whoa, kind of got the chills. My mom found it and she's like, you got to read this. And I was like, this is pretty cool. Like, I didn't even know that was the path I was going to choose and kind of, you know, making some dreams come true. I just find it really fascinating from like a psychology point of view and inspiration point of view to kind of even know if that was something that you set as a, you know, as a, as a young, as a young girl, right. As a young woman and, and you put it in your brain and it was in your heart and it's just like, you were just in the background working towards it whilst enjoying the journey. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm all about sports psych and all that. And uh -huh. I've just been a setter obviously since I was really young and have my, my monthly goals, my yearly goals and my lifetime goals. So for sure, I, I believe in all that stuff. So mm. whether I knew it or not subconsciously, I yeah. think I was going after that goal. Yeah, it's interesting. And now, you know, in like popular culture, we've got the phrase, um, you need to see it to believe it. And we kind of go out to our life and, you know, it's almost like a prudent way of living where you go, well, you know, we better just make sure that, that we can see it first as a result in our life before we decide about that. Uh, and yeah. then the irony of that, it can be, you know, it can hold us back from really, you know, being more courageous. It can hold us back from um, actually committing uh, to specific goals, et cetera. So that, you know, if I'm like on stage doing a speech, I always kind of make the point that you need to believe stuff first before you then start seeing the results. And like, I'll apply that to my business, to sales, to personal development. And, you know, it's kind of getting in that zone where if you need to, you know, smash it to the next level and really take things up a notch, um, you've got to do something inside of here and here first from a psychological point of view because only then do you start actually practicing that, whether that be doing that extra workout, that extra session, that extra whatever the stretch is. I mean, do you have oh, any yeah. thoughts around that in terms of like putting belief first? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's what you need to do. You know, we are on a mission to win a gold medal. It's like mm -hmm. we, we don't see that gold medal. We have to believe that we can do it before we go out and do it. Um, mm -hmm. But I think kind of my philosophy is the little things make the big things happen. And it yeah. kind of goes along with what you're saying, but you know, you first have to set those little goals and just start ticking those off. And before you know it, they'll become bigger and bigger. You know, mm -hmm. growing up, it was like, I want to win CIF, which is high school championship. And then mm -hmm. you did it and you're like, Whoa, I want to go to college for polo. I want to win NC two A's. And then before you know it, the next thing on your list is uh, become an Olympian. Yes. Um, so I think that, I think that can also help and kind of similar to what you were saying. Totally. And if you, the, you know, I think that's all about building momentum, momentum, self-esteem, actual performance, mm -hmm. you know, of course, because you're, you keep on, you know, challenging yourself, et cetera. And, and again, if I mirror that to personal development, you kind of got, 
your, your thoughts, your feelings and your actions. So like imagine a little pyramid Yeah. and you can stay people. I think people in life, we get stuck sometimes staying either just in our head and then we're not feeling courageous in our heart. And then between you know being in the head and not courageous here, we never get into action, right? So what you're speaking to from an athletic point of view is literally the movement, the healthy, vibrant movement of continuously achieving goals and stepping up as you go along the way. Yeah, definitely. And also being okay to fail. Like failure ha uh-huh. happens every single day and it, in regards to water polo i mean surfing as well but with team sport you fail every single day swim sets w- weight room drills and that's okay you know just being accepting the failure and just mm-hmm. knowing that there's still room to get better mm, exactly now go back to rio in 2016 the water polo you know winning gold and um, can i can i can i get a sense of like if you take you back to that moment where you finally you realize you've won and you're standing you know on that podium and um, what does that feel like it's insane not even you know i can't even describe it um overwhelming emotions you kind of have or at least i did have this like almost picture from when you were a little eight-year-old who started playing water polo to all the ups and downs that come with sport come with teammates come with family and just kind of flash forward your little journey and just to be on the top and realize you got there it it was a really special moment and also just watching your your flag race too it's was one of the most proud moments I, I was to be an American. And, mm-hmm. um, and then another moment that I'll forever remember is hugging my family afterwards, like running over the stands and being able to hug them was, was really special. Oh gosh. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. I think that's awesome. Um, okay. Um, so tell us about surfing as well. So you're competing internationally, you're involved with the, um, the world surf league and it and again, going back to kind of some of your backstory, I believe that you were a back-to-back champion, uh, two years in a row, if I remember correctly, from the U.S. Surfing Championship? Yeah, so surfing, um, I knew I had to pick two sports. And uh-huh. realistically, with schedules and stuff, I knew basketball was going to be out. So I, was, I played basketball all the way through eighth grade, loved it, uh, look up to many basketball players. And that's what my first dream was. But then I just started liking surfing and water polo. And ironically, my success kind of happened at the same time. Uh, I started getting noticed early high school from the USA surf team. And that's the same time I was getting recruited for water polo to go to college. And I was just a stubborn little girl who wasn't willing to choose a sport. You know, I loved them both for so many reasons, but, you know, similarly loved the same. And I just knew that I was going to do whatever it took to be successful at both. So my hours and still to this day are crazy, you know, go mm-hmm. surf, go to water polo practice, surf in between, go back to double days of water polo practice. And that's been my life seriously for 10 years, 10 plus years now. But um, yeah, so I was able to compete on the Team USA from 2010 to 2015. Mm-hmm. And then I had to, I went to college and college was actually my freshman year was very tough for me at USC because I'm watching some of my closest friends travel the world and be very successful in the world qualifying series and actually qualify for the world championship tour, which is, you know, the, the elite tour that everyone's striving to get on in the surfing world. Right. So I didn't know, and I wasn't really getting much playing time at USC. I wasn't having the best time. I was a little homesick and I, I was ready to quit water polo and quit school and go and make a run at surfing. Um, uh-huh. Fortunately I didn't, you know, yeah. Wow. Look at that. And then, you know, years later, you, you literally gold medalist. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, I refound my passion and just realized the college education is is forever and this water polo, you know, is forever as there's uh, a very small period and just to go and get after it. And I think once I finally made that commitment and that decision, my water polo uh just got a lot better. Um yep. but still in the back of my mind, I want to give surfing a 100% commitment at some point. So hopefully after uh, things go well in Tokyo and I make the team, I can give surfing everything I have and, you know, and, and see where I can really take it. Cause it's kind of been on the back burner for 10 years now. Yet you're doing it right. Cause I've looked at the achievement history and it's, it's quite uncanny. It's it, you know, when you look at the, you know, 2000 of this, 2000 and that, 2000 of that, you, you, there's almost like a parallel nature to the things that you're achieving in terms of, you know, a championship here or whatever here, you know, like there's all sorts of things going on pretty much in sync. So it's kind of, it's um it sounds like it's a testimony to a passionate determination not to have to give one up um and yes you have trials along the way where you get tested to say can I do both and I want this but can I do both you know um but but you are doing it so you know um do you think there's any advantage to it both being in the water yeah I think there's some I mean both are great cross training for one another and I don't know for me 
the water to me almost is more of a mental escape, whether it is the pool or the ocean, it's just helped me so much more mentally. Mm -hmm. And I think I've done over the years, I've become a lot more mature and understanding of like where I'm at and know that right now, this year, in the past couple of years, you know, water polo is priority. So surfing, I'm not going to get critical when I get to a session out with my buddies, you know, I'm not going to do video analysis that much. I'm not going to work too much with coaches and stress myself out. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to have fun. Of course, as a competitive human, you want to always be better, but I'm trying to take that side out and just use it as a mental escape. And I, I'm sure when I retire from water polo, I want to jump in the swimming pool when, when surfing is getting tough and when I'm not making heats and and do the same and it will then become my mental escape will be the pool. So, um, yeah, I'm doing both, but right now water polo is a focus, especially with the COVID and everything. There hasn't been a contest over a year. Right. That must've been a difficult year in terms of, you know, because you know, okay, clearly I'm sure, um, would you, would you, would you call yourself competitive and an achiever? Yeah. And that's like totally cool. Cause of course that, you know, you're doing amazing <laughs> yeah. things that makes sense to me. Right. So yeah. What's, what's it, how have you managed in, in the 2020 that the year it was, um, what did you do to try and activate that, you know, achiever and that competitive spirit since there weren't competitions? Like how did you get through that year from, you know, from that kind of like mindset point of view? Yeah, well, it's actually, I have a really unique story in the sense that I got um, pretty severely injured in South Korea. We were out celebrating our world champs in 2019. Yeah. Um, and it took a lot of effort to recover. And I was doing 12 hours a day with whether it was practice or physical therapy or manual therapy. And I didn't even realize how burnt out I was until mm. the pause. So, and then on top of that, I lost a couple huge mentors. Um, coach Barnett passed away and he was my high school coach and one of my biggest uh, fans and just an all amount around water polo legend. Mm-hmm. And then Kobe Bryant actually helped me out in my recovery. And I, I've met him before I got injured, but he helped me out and reached out and checked in and gave me some of his resources. And we actually call my recovery, the Mamba mission, because our trainer Larney knows that Kobe was such a huge influence in my life. So that was July of 2019. And then he passed in January of 2020. So all of this, um, his passing, my traumatic injury, I was just focused on the physical because I was like, I need to make this team. I need to get better. I'm already behind. Mm -hmm. So I put in these 12 hour days and just work, work, work that I realized there was so much more mental that I didn't take care of from the injury and from going to surgery in a foreign country. And when Kobe passed, it brought up a lot of the feelings that I pushed away. And I actually dealt with a few panic attacks in February of 2020, a month before the Olympics were postponed. So the postponement, I mean, it was still to put that much effort and work and grow as a team and get so close, you know, we were rounding third base. And we were just getting to the fun part and to have that postponed, everyone had different emotions and you had to let every individual grieve in their own way. But now looking back, it gave me the time to reach out to therapists and work on myself and really almost turn off that competitive mind that you were talking about Mm. and just really focus on myself and, and enjoy and slow down, you know, with two sports and just with my lifestyle, I'm always going too fast. And that also is uh, affected me in my panic attack. So it's been, if you look full circle and gosh forbid, it's just been a crazy year and COVID and all that. But for me personally, it might've been a blessing in disguise. Wow. Wow. That's yeah. You're giving me goosebumps talking about that. Um, right. Okay. And, and were there any, just out of interest in me, sorry, sorry, I, I feel everything you just said. And, and, and when it comes to the recovery, like, cause what about attitudes to things? So what I mean by that is, um, for example, you must have a certain attitude to your training regime. Like just before we started recording, you literally said to me, Hey, yep. Been to surfing. I've been to polar practice. Like you don't, you already like done two training sessions and now you're jumping <laughs> onto this. Like you must, um, I want to use the word consistently. Cause I, I think my analogy of like, I go to the gym and I'll do weights. Right. So I know that I won't get those results unless I go to the gym three times a week and I do my sets and certain things I've got to turn up mm-hmm. and do it. Right. Um, and that's how you build certain athletic results, right? Um, so the word consistency comes up for me. Um, were there any parallels, whether it be consistency or any other kind of attitudes that you take towards your regular training? Were there any parallels that you applied um, to your recovery from like a PT point of view, et cetera? Um, yeah, well, consistency, definitely. Like you nailed that one for all the reasons you said. 
um, hard work. And I think pos- positivity, you know, yeah. you can go, you are literally on the verge of going dark any second, you know, like why me, you could go down that rabbit hole, but it wasn't worth it. Um, mm. You know, two people passed away in the, the balcony collapse, you know, we were out celebrating, it was a nightclub. And oh, gosh. so, wow. yeah, it, it was insane and wow. dark and all that. So I think in knowing that I still had an opportunity at a full recovery it mm. made the positivity rather easily um yeah. especially with uh i woke up from surgery and they told me i was millimeters away from my nerve so what that means <sighs> is millimeters away from having a functioning foot and wow. it took a while to get to that point i was like okay cool like when can i start training instead of like taking a breath and just ex- realizing how lucky i got and that came with time and with help and it takes a village to get back from an injury like that um, yeah. both mentally and physically and I just have been so supportive from so many people and I think there's gra- a lot of gratitude in, in this whole journey 100 percent. and you know as well as like focusing on community and focusing on positivity it sounds like that was a very um yeah, indeed a traumatic experience to be amongst a, a balcony collapse and other people passing away and um I think the thing I want to share in that moment as well to relate to you is that gosh, I think it was 11 years ago, my parents passed away and they were killed in an avalanche, right? In France and like wow. boom, gone, right? And Sorry. what I realized through my experience of that is that it was almost my, my analogy, and I know this is quite literal, but it's like, I'm on a knife edge and, and I'm looking down and one one down there is like literally the abyss of the, the kind of like the, the vacuum that you could get sucked into mentally if I focus on the negative or if I focus yeah. on, um, you know, maybe the idea of becoming, you know, being seen as a victim. Like I, I, I saw like an abyss of where I could live the rest of my life and yeah. you know, I, could, I could be around people and I go, Oh, well, bless him. He was all, he'd never be the same again because that happened to him. And I saw that straight away. And on the other side, I saw a choice where I could go, I need to move through this process and do it healthily, but I'm not going to get sucked into, you know, the abyss because that's just so dark that I just don't want to go there. So I say that out of relating to, you know, when you go through some very dark experiences and, um, you know, you know, you've got to get through it. Sometimes it's about literally it's inside here, right? You go, go I'm yeah. not going there. I'm going to move through this healthily, but I'm not going to go to this option where I could stay there and never be the same again. Yeah. And I think it's important to know that there will be dark days. It's not all rainbows and butterflies, uh, but just having those choices, like you said, and uh, I, I mentioned coach Barnett and he used mm. to quote, uh, there are choices you make in everything you do, but you must must always keep in mind those choices make you. Correct. So Correct. yeah, that kind of just popped in my head when you were talking about that. Yeah, and it and it hasn't been easy. I'm sure your journey's been a lot harder than mine, but just having the help and having the the perspective, I think, is is huge. Well, the the word choice, right? Like the, the, literally, the, the tagline of our business is "Choose powerfully every day." It's literally that consistency thing again, right? And um, yeah, you know. Um, the, <laughs> the choice leads to the results always, whether that be, uh, you know, your nutrition or your workout. Actually, there's a segue. I want to ask you, um, like what, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued, right? What do you do nutritionally? I, I, what, what does it mean to be an, a multi-sport athlete doing what you do with all these sessions? But like, how do you nurture your body? I'm, I'm fascinated. Yeah, well, it's actually pretty cool. Um, in college and even in high school, you were kind of told what you had to eat. We had a pretty strict college coach. But now, you know, we're professional athletes. Everything is our choice. And people on our team, uh, you know, there's some young young girls on the team who can eat goldfish and Oreos and still crush a game, you know, and I'm <laughs> older. And that's never been the case for me. But we have so many resources. We have a, two amazing nutritionists. We have, you know, we get blood work done to see where our levels are. We have a, spon- mm-hmm. um, a bunch of vitamin sponsors. So We are giving everything we need to be elite athletes and we just have to choose what works best for us. Mm -hmm. Um, That comes with trial and error. There'll be, you know, phases of training where you bulk up. There's phases of training. So maybe it might be creatine time or protein time. There'll be phases of training when you want to slim down. And that's just having the trust in our strength and conditioning coach, our nutritionist coach, they have a plan and we follow it. You know, we might not be excited with how we feel or how we look at that time, but we need to realize, oh, this is the period where we're supposed to be doing this because that's what our very professional and trustworthy coaches have put in plan. Um, but for me, I'm all about tons of vitamins every single day. Uh, hydration's huge. So I'll take a bunch of electrolytes a couple times a day. Mm-hmm. And then really with food, when we're in full-time training, 
we kind of can get away with whatever we want to eat, but knowing that whatever you put in your body is going to make you feel that way. Correct. So if it's a Saturday, finished practice, and I want to drink a couple glasses of wine, I'm going to do it. Mm-hmm. But knowing that that's not going to be the case five days a week or on a night before training. Or if I want to have ice cream on Sunday, my off day, then so be it. But just knowing that Monday through basically Saturday at 11, like I'm pretty sharp and dialed and eat. I mean, a day looks like overnight oats in the morning. We get um, catered food to the pool. So that's usually a sandwich of some sort with some veggies. And then at night it's, you know, chicken, veggie, pasta. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's not something super strict. You just figure it out, I think, as as you go on. And you've got the support, right? You've got because you're at that that level, you've got the support of nutritionists and coaches around you. Um, But it's interesting. You mentioned alcohol as well, right? So again, for me, um, both from an you know from working out point of view, like I I hate going to the gym on even just like one beer the night before. Like I notice it. It's like it's like your heart goes fuck you, you know. Like you. Um, and I, I, I don't like that at all. So I take a very similar attitude to not, you know, drinking during the week. And I also take that attitude because of work and, you know, wanting to perform at my best. And so I think yeah. with high performance, whether it be in your personal life, um, athletics, uh, or indeed in your profession, um, I think, uh, yeah, to me, like everyone's different and everyone can take it. Like I'm 37 going on 38 soon and, and I just can't take my booze anymore. So <laughs> Um, so that's also part of it and but I save my drinking for the weekend because of that um yeah yeah um right now it's interesting sorry yeah I think like especially with us and maybe it's the older than I've been doing this for a while now but also as an athlete I think you just become a little bit more aware of your body whether if you're at the gym or not or if you're competing for an Olympic games I think there's just this an awareness level Mm -hmm. so you can feel that just one beer I think if it's a normal person having a beer and going on their morning run, maybe they don't, they don't feel it as much, but there's this awareness and there's like, we call them water polo gods. There's this water polo God looming in the back of your head always and being like, Oh, are these two beers going to affect me performing tomorrow? AKA me making teams, AKA making mm-hmm. my dreams come true. Mm-hmm. That's the way I look at it. So, mm-hmm. um, but at the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm the first person to be like, you need to have fun on your day off and, and yep. relax and enjoy. You can't be all tight and wound up or else, right. you know, you could crack e- easily. I do enjoy that you're able to do both. I think that's really that's really fun. And I'm the same on the weekend, too. Um, yeah. And, and, and actually, really interesting point about being able to notice the difference. So, you know, I've done multitudes of health challenges and, you know, 30 day programs and all that kind of stuff. Like, you know, all the they're not fads like I generally, you know, I, I do enjoy them. I think they're great. Um, and in that, my examples would be dairy and, and gluten. And again, it's not yeah. for everyone. Some people are fine with that. But when I did 30 days without um, without gluten, my wife and I then had like a French baguette with you know brie cheese and a glass of wine to celebrate on day 30. And it was like someone hit me in the stomach with a sledgehammer. Um, oh, my body God. just reacted going, like, you know, you feel bloated and all that stuff. So really interesting distinction. The cleaner you get, the more you notice when you put whatever the, you know, the, the, the crap is basically yeah. in yeah um, definitely. yeah right that's really interesting so okay yeah that that's interesting do you see that anywhere else because that, that that's actually got me quite fascinated so that kind of pops up for the booze you know ice cream gluten maybe dairy like a, are there any other analogies like that where the cleaner you get and also the high performing you get you notice when you bring it back in whether it be nutritionally or i don't know any other things in life that kind yeah. of has me fascinated i think um manual therapy like we do a lot of uh cupping and treatment and massage therapies and stretching so i think you can feel it um when you start doing that more yep and then you stop you feel it a lot so water polo Mm -hmm. shoulders are really big for all of us and we get treatment on our shoulders um most treatment is cupping i'm not sure if you're aware of that i I know cupping that's one where you get like you get it with the the, the vacuum right it's the chinese therapy if i remember and you go onto the back and it comes off and then it often leaves a little mark there for quite a while, doesn't it? Yeah. So I think the, the idea behind that is it's pulling away to let blood flow get through better yeah. because the more blood flow you have, the less uh, tension and soreness and all that. So it just helps the muscles recover. So mm. we'll do that. And then there's manual work that our trainer will do. And we have a schedule and a lot of people get treatment on the team two to three times a week or so. And I mm. think when you stop that, you can really feel it. God, that's shoulder. interesting. I've never heard. I, 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 that's the first time I've 
my ignorance i didn't know cupping was relevant at that kind of um yeah athletic recovery point of view That's yeah i've got bruises all over my shoulder because i got treatment yesterday nice <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I think it's just, so we call it recovery and there's like very tons of aspects. That's just one aspect. Uh, Norma tech, those compression boots that you wear, those giant sleeves on your leg yeah. that put pressure in it's same idea behind it. It's just to get blood flow, but there's, um, as yeah, a therapy really yeah a therapy you put that onto like, right. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. They look like giant, like, uh, pants, basically like pants sleeves. And then there just pushes air into it. And I think, when you get more on top of your recovery, uh-huh. like with the diet, you can feel feel better. And then when you stop, you can definitely feel not as good. Yeah, wow. You're not getting involved with anything strange like leeches or anything, nothing old school. No, not yet. <laughs> we'll, I'll, we'll update you when USA Women's Water Polo starts the leech program. <laughs> yeah. Back to the old England in the, in the days of the kings yeah. and queens. Have some leeches, you'll be fine. <laughs> Yeah, right. Okay. That's, that's cool. So um, now I want to kind of go towards advice because you, you've gone through these things and you, you clearly had some incredible mentors in your life, whether that be um, your coach um, at high school, or your father, you know, multitudes of people around you. And right now, you know, it sounds like there's an amazing network along the way. Um, if you were to put yourself in the, um, you know, in the shoes now of giving some advice to someone that was either, it doesn't matter, a child or, or an aspiring adult in in the areas of athletics, so what advice would you give to them? I think, um, I don't know where I picked this up along the way, but just enjoying and laughing. There's so many people that are so tense and tense and put so much pressure on themselves that they forget to enjoy what they're doing, whether that's sport or school or work. Mm-hmm. And just kind of, I mean, as cliche as it sounds, and I think this year has taught us more than ever is just to enjoy the journey. You know, you can't just always have your mind set on the destination or you'll forget everything that happens until you get there or won't enjoy it and just be thinking, okay, when is this, when's this date going to happen? When's this goal going to happen? Um, you know, I, I talked earlier about how important goal setting is, which is true, but you have to also put in the work and be present throughout to be able to achieve those goals. Yeah, nice. Um, and and I think that's almost like the uh, the yang of the sorry the yin um, of the yang, right? So the yang is the is the what you'd expect from an athlete in terms of competitiveness and and achievement and really going for the goal, uh, which is you know the, the more powerful, forceful energy. And then the yeah the yin is uh, yeah the enjoyment. So it's kind of I, I see that it, as you're saying that I saw the yin yang black and white yeah. thing in my mind. I thought it's literally being able to, it's not just doing that. It's be, it's doing both and having balance along the way, right? Yeah. I mean, um, and also with the enjoyment comes connections. So really okay. putting the effort into your teammates or your family or your coworkers, whatever that may be, because that allows the enjoyment to come so much easier. And um, I actually asked Kobe this a few years back about balance, because obviously mm. you hear stories of him being a freak at 4 a.m., just grinding, working, working. Mm-hmm. But you also hear stories after his retirement of it being a loving father mm-hmm. and, and husband and all that. So I asked about balance and he basically said, imagine if you're on a tight rope, tight rope mm-hmm. and you're trying to walk across this tight rope and it's like gale force winds mm. and you're just getting pushed back and forth. And there's no such thing as perfect balance where you can walk across, you know, maybe you'll lean a little bit too far to the left, which might be athletics. And that's when your family or your friends come in and pull you a little right. And just being okay with people to pull you out when you get too deep in one another or yourself being aware enough to pull you out when you get too deep. You know, if I'm going out every weekend with my friends, that's when I have to have the realization, like, look, if this isn't the time to do this, it's, it's season, it's Olympic year, like pull yourself back, you know, take some Saturdays off, enjoy, rest, recover. Oh, love it. Love it. So literally it's the self-awareness thing, right? So, and it's, uh, yeah. and, that, and I feel like that's the thing that makes it sustainable. Yeah, I would agree. I think, I think the self-awareness is huge, but sometimes the, the reality is you aren't, you will miss those opportunities. And that's when you can have these friends or family members that you rely on pull you and, and have the courage to call you out when need be. Hopefully that you become aware enough where those times become less and less, but mm-hmm. just having people that are there to get you back on track when need, when you need to. Love it. I love it. Absolutely love it. Um, tell me about what success looks like in terms of the people that you surround yourself with. So I know that I know that you've had mentors, but like, you know, are there any other insights that you've got in terms of advice you'd give to people? Because um, 
I suppose there's also the networking aspect. And, and that to me, by the way, I, I feel, this is just a, tell me if the, this is a hypothesis. If you're really bloody good at what you do, i.e. achievement, competitiveness, the actual doing of it, and you're also in the type of person that's just a nice person and enjoys it and smiles and, you know, is, is a, kind of like a likable person. Um, maybe this is my own self-beliefs here, but I feel like you're more magnetic. And when you're more magnetic in your personality, um, then you might be more um, likely through circumstance and actually not through circumstance, through intention to actually put yourself in front of the right people that kind of create those opportunities. Like what, what's, you know, have there been any instances where you go, my gosh, if I hadn't met that person in that moment, then I wouldn't have been on the US team. You know, like what kinds of networking and connections and, you know, that kind of relationship stuff yeah. got you to that point? I mean, I don't, networking, the word for me is a little hard because it almost right. seems like you're trying. And, Aha, and, and work, I know, work, yeah. Yeah, in, in a work world, totally understand. And like, yes, there will be times when your intentions are to network and to make these connections. But in, I hope to think that like, just you being yourself, like you said, is going to connect you with those people and going back and connecting the dots of how you got to where you are, mm -hmm. you realize maybe then it actually was networking and you didn't even know it. Yes. It was just point. you being, mm -hmm. you being you and being, you know, through the opportunities that we have, we've been put in front of amazing people and just being authentic when you see them and not trying to suck up or try too hard or be someone who you're not. And if you're authentic, I think then those connections become real and can set you up to whatever it may be in athletics, in work, in personal life. Totally. Yeah, totally get that. Yeah, because if you, if, you, if you kind of go up to someone and give that energy of like, hello, I'm here to network. This is my business card. Yes. You, what can you do for me? What can I do for you? And like, you, it's kind of desperate, right? And Yeah, um, exactly. But it's so many people. It's like, especially with social media, it's like, it's a thing now. It's always been a thing, but I feel like there's a little yeah. bit more um, meaning to networking these days. Yeah, they're very much so. You're right. You're absolutely right. And, and I've got better at that as I got older. And I know that it does help when, you, when you're genuinely good at what you do. That helps when you're yeah. in a role where you can say, I'm an Olympic gold medalist. That helps. I get that. But it's about the pairing of the authenticity, you know, when you just are and you just turn up. Um, and I think, and I think it's also maturity within oneself to kind of basically not be the desperate networker where you're going to, yeah, <laughs> I, I actually really understand that. And I found that that in my own life just brings more organic success because you're just not trying and you're just enjoying and you're being yourself. Yeah. And I think that's something that, um, we play a small sport, you know, women's mm -hmm. water polo, small sport, and we are all aware of that. Right. And you know, we're this blue collar, hard working team and we take pride in that. And I think we take pride in our humility and it's a very tough balance because we've had success. And I think our team and the sport demands there, sh we should have more. Mm -hmm. um, we're always working for more. And the women that came before, before us got up to us to where we are. And now we need to set up for the next generation um, but we're balancing it with all of us on the team have come from humble backgrounds, humble families, and humility has been a huge value in not only our team's kind of upbringing, but also the individual's upbringing. So mm. to go and be like, I'm an Olympic gold medalist, like that makes me feel uncomfortable. I think I okay. only pulled the Olympic card like a week or two after we won gold to get into, get some free things and get some parties <laughs> with my friends. And that's basically it. And I was like, all right, that card was fun gotta can't bring it out for another four years until we win again <laughs> oh what a fabulous but, i love that that's such a fabulously healthy attitude and yeah yeah that that's um i get that too because i kind of got those more grassroots upbringing so yeah whatever yeah. you get in life if you can be humble along the way and just genuine right yeah huh. so i think a lot of that's thanks to our team and our coaches and and just usa women's water polo way back from the 80s on mm -hmm. that's fascinating that's fascinating wow okay so we're now in 2021. We're recording this at the end of uh, January, right? Um, tell me about the year ahead for you. Tell me more about what that looks like. Well, our we joke as a team because our coach basically says the year of 2021 is TBD, to be determined. Yeah, right. Because there's so much uncertainty and unknown, and he's very organized. So if this was an Olympic year without COVID going on, we would have our calendar from January 1st to the Olympic finals, August 7th. Mm -hmm. and tell you every single day to every single hour of what we would be doing yep. who's coming where we're gonna go who we're training against who, what games are where and now it's just up in the air right now in our calendar we have canada's coming over next wednesday in a week 
Mm-hmm. They, we still haven't gotten the okay from our training center with COVID and stuff. So we don't know. It's seven days away. We're not sure if they're going to come Seven days or not. away. You can't even plan seven days ahead. Yeah, I get it. No. I understand. Wow. But, yeah, yeah, but I, I would imagine this year is going to be a lot of training at home, a lot of competition against ourselves, which we aren't that excited. We like to beat other teams down instead of beat each other up. <laughs> um, but looks like we'll have hopefully Canada coming hopefully Russia coming. And then we're going to go train in Hawaii to get away. Um, and that should be the next few months. And then besides that, we're not quite sure. Wow. Yeah. I love that. So as well as, as well as uh, walking the tightrope of enjoying the things and also achieving stuff, it sounds like one needs to be very grounded um, amongst uncertainty, right? But still with the right yeah. attitude, success is 100% possible. Yeah. And we're all pretty type A individuals on the team. So this is all new yeah. for us. We're, we're learning and we want to get information as soon as Adam knows and confirms it. So this is all new, but um, yeah, it's just the, the year of TBD. Wow, TBD. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh, man. Well, look, I, I, I hope that you get to those Olympics. I hope that you guys win. Um, I, I, so that'd be absolutely brilliant to, um, to understand uh, the journey that you've been on and, and what's been inside both your head and your heart. Um, Kelly, thank you so much for coming on today. If people um, want to connect with you or, or follow you, you know, what, where's, where can they find you online? What's the kind of places that they can go to watch your journey? Yeah. I mean, thanks for having me. This was awesome chit chatting with you and I'm glad you're going to root for us in Tokyo over the Australian team because they're pretty good themselves. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I've got no allegiances. I grew up in the UK, so I kind of got the British passport. Actually, I don't have a British passport anymore. I should get that renewed. Um, I'm an Australian <laughs> one. So I've got both. So I can kind of like just jump between. I'm a wife's right. American. So, you know, and my kids are actually American too because with the passports. There so there you go. So I'm like, I'm just a whore of the world. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you can find me on Instagram at Kaylee Gilchrist and then Twitter K Gilchrist 10. Fantastic. Awesome. Kaylee, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. And uh, I'll put the links uh, to everything you just mentioned there in the show notes. Awesome. Thanks for having me. It was great chatting.